One of the most important pieces of equipment in your homebrew setup is also one of the least discussed pieces of equipment, your chiller. Everyone makes a huge deal and markets brewing systems and fermenters like crazy, but no one ever really talks about chillers. Oftentimes they're kind of included as an afterthought in many brewing systems, but it's actually one of the most important things you could possibly set up in your home brewery. So today we're gonna talk chillers. There are many different kinds of chilling options for your wort, and there's many different reasons why they would appeal very much specifically to one person over another. If you're wondering why a counterflow chiller might be better than a plate chiller or an immersion chiller might be better than all of them, it all depends on your personal situation, and we're gonna break that down in this video. So a question is gonna come up as a result of filming this video is why is chilling important in the first place? Why is this such a big deal? So there's a lot to it actually. What the chilling process does is it precipitates out hop debris and it precipitates out starches, proteins, any other gunk that's not really fermentable. All that hop debris and protein and gunk that drops down to the bottom of the kettle is called trube. And when that trube makes its way into the fermenter, it takes up space. If you transfer all the trube from your kettle into your fermenter along with the rest of your wort, it takes up a significant amount of volume and none of that is usable beer. When you get it into your actual beer, it will fall to the bottom of the keg or the bottom of the bottle and will still precipitate out of the beer and it's not really tasty when you drink it. So what I'm getting at here is chilling is important because it gets you more usable wort, more volume of clean, good, solid beer at the end of the process. The second thing that chilling is going to do for you is it's going to speed your process up. It enables you to get your wort into your fermenter and get the yeast pitched on it much faster. The longer the wort sits, uh, at a higher temperature of about 70 degrees to 150 or 160 degrees, it is vulnerable to infection by bacteria, by wild yeasts floating through the air or through anything really that's kind of floating through your brew house. Um, insects can get into it and contaminate it that way as well. None of these things are really particularly good unless you're going for a wild fermented beer, but nine times out of 10 people usually aren't. The faster you get your wort chilled and your yeast pitched into your wort, the better chance that yeast has at dominating the environment there and preventing any further uh, sort of contamination. And the final reason it's very important to chill is to stop hop isomerization. Plain and simple, chilling quickly prevents you from over bittering your beer by accident by letting the hops sit hot in the wort for too long. So now that we know why chilling is important, let's talk about the options we have. The first option is actually a valid option, and it's a no-chill method, skipping the chilling step entirely. This kind of spits in the face of everything that I mentioned earlier as to why chilling is important, but there are kind of some ways around it. No-chill is very, very popular in extremely hot climates where chilling water in general is going to be actually relatively hot and probably hotter than the pitching temperature of the yeast. So oftentimes what brewers will do is put the actual hot, almost boiling wort into what's known as a hot cube. This is a special kind of plastic cube um, that is supposedly tolerant of those temperatures and is able to be sealed. This prevents the wort from spoiling, but it also allows the wort to naturally cool off over a very long period of time until later. And at that point, once the wort is finally cooled, then you can take it out of the hot cube and put it into a fermenter and pitch your yeast and carry on as usual. Well, I understand it's not ideal for many types of beer. There's a lot of people that live in parts of the world where you can't run five to 10 gallons of chilling water through a chiller and actually have good results. This is also relevant if you live in a place where water usage is highly regulated or you're using your own actual finite amount of water supply to get the job done. If you're trying to get this done on a budget and you don't want to buy a wort chiller, one very effective way to do this is to immerse your brew kettle in either a large sink full of ice water or a bathtub full of ice water and just let the chill happen that way. This will take some time, um, but it is certainly a method to use, especially if you're rolling on a budget. But if you're actually going to take the plunge to get a dedicated wort chiller, and I recommend you do, there are generally three main options to work with here. You have number one, an immersion chiller, number two, a plate chiller, and number three, a counterflow chiller. And we'll talk about the strengths and weaknesses of all three of those now. The immersion chiller is really simple in construction. It's a large coil of copper pipe. So basically what you do is you're gonna run cold water through the chiller on one side and run an output hose on the other side. That cold water is gonna run through the copper coil and because of the properties of copper, it's gonna transfer heat very, very quickly from the hot wort into the cold water and vice versa. 
all wort chiller efficiency is going to be highly dependent on the temperature of the cold water coming into it. Um, so the colder your water is in general, the better efficiency the chilling you're going to get. Immersion chiller of the three though is kind of the least efficient one. It cools very effectively in a very small region around each part of the copper pipe. But any wort that's a little bit of a distance away from the actual copper pipe is going to take a lot longer to chill. Oftentimes people will stir the wort as uh, the immersion chillers in there to kind of get it to circulate around and get a better chilling efficiency that way and that's certainly an option. There's a wide variety of prices and a wide variety of sizes on this. Immersion chillers can be as cheap as $35 to $40 for a small coil or they can go very expensive into the multiple hundreds of dollars for a very large coil and a very effective chiller. One of the nice things about immersion chillers is there's no volume loss, there's no dead space in it. Because it's just going directly into the kettle, you don't have to fill the chiller up with worts, so it's very easy to sanitize it as well. Just drop it into your kettle in the last 10 minutes of the boil and it will be sanitary by the time it's time to chill. Uh, it's very easy to whirlpool with these too because there is a kind of circular shape to them, uh, so you can generally whirlpool around them very effectively as well. They're also very, very easy to clean. It's just a simple spray down to get the job done. Uh, unfortunately though, they do tend to have a rather large footprint. Um, so like they take up a lot of space on the shelf basically is what I'm saying there. But this is honestly the most common one out there and it's what most kind of entry level systems or entry level kits will come with. I will stress though, an entry level immersion chiller is not the best option. So if you have the budget for it and you like the way the immersion chiller works, I would recommend upgrading your immersion chiller into something much, much bigger and stronger later down the road as you become a uh, more experienced brewer. The second option is a plate chiller. Plate chillers come with things like the claw hammer system and uh, a very famous one is a Therminator plate chiller. On paper, they seem to be the most efficient kind of chiller. Um, and what it does essentially is it splits the wort up into lots of tiny little pathways and it forces the wort through very narrow channels between copper plates where the water uh, runs kind of in an opposite path through a similar setup. And what that does is it allows you to pass the wort through the chiller and actually chill it as it goes through in a single pass. And that's one of the big strengths of an immersion chiller in general is that you are able to chill the wort on the way to the fermenter in most cases. Again, like an immersion chiller, there's a wide variety of prices on these and a wide variety of sizes, um, but they can run a lot more expensive than immersion chillers. One of the benefits of a plate chiller though is that because because they're so efficient, you're going to use a lot less water than an immersion chiller. So if water usage is important to you, this might be one of your options. The heat exchangers in most commercial breweries are typically plate style chillers. Uh, so it's really just a smaller version of that sort of thing. Luckily though, the homebrew scale versions of these things are not very big at all. They're actually the smallest chiller footprint out of them all. So that's generally something that uh, if you're short on space, you might want to look into this. Unfortunately though, one of the strengths of the plate chiller is also its greatest weakness. Those very narrow channels are extremely difficult to ensure that you actually have them clean and if you're brewing with tons of hops they can clog very very easily. In order for plate chillers to continue being efficient in their running they have to be maintained meticulously because you can't really open it up to clean it or anything you have to flush it out after every brew you have to recirculate PBW through it to clean it and many people actually will bake the plate chiller in the oven for a little while to really ensure that it's sanitary. You can pass boiling wort through it to sanitize it, so it is uh, still possible to sanitize during the brew day, but um, you don't know really whether or not there's mold inside of your plate chiller because you can't really take it apart. So that's one of the downsides of it for sure. And then we come to the final type of chiller, which is the one that I'm currently using. Don't let that bias you though, because the reason why I'm using it may not be the reason why you might want it. And that is a counterflow chiller. Essentially what a counterflow chiller is, is a pipe inside of another pipe in a coil. Wort will basically travel through the internal pipe, which is copper, and then water will travel the opposite direction through the external pipe, uh, which can really be any material. As the water passes through the opposite direction, it will strip heat out of the wort. As far as efficiency goes, counterflow chillers actually sit somewhere between plate chillers and immersion chillers. They're not really as efficient as plate chillers are, although many of them are very, very close in efficiency. Because they're not forcing uh, the wort through very, very narrow pathways. They do use a lot more water to chill down, although I would argue not nearly as much water as an immersion chiller. In the same way as the plate chiller, you're still able to chill most times in a single pass through the counterflow chiller from the brew kettle into the fermenter. 
However, what makes a counterflow chiller very appealing to me is the fact that it's hard to clog. It's, you're gonna have to work really, really hard to clog these things. Because it's not going through these narrow channels like in the plate chiller, it's much easier to force hops through those pipes and it's very, very easy to sanitize and clean as a result of that. It's much easier for me to go to bed thinking that I don't have mold in my counterflow chiller versus my plate chiller. Unfortunately though, counterflow chillers tend to be the most expensive of the three types of chillers. They're either made of copper or stainless steel for the most part. They also can be kind of large uh, and they tend to take up about as much room as the immersion chiller does as well. I've been using a counterflow chiller called the X Chillerator for a long time. I bought that with my own money. That company never talked to me, so that's just my honest opinion. I think that's the best counterflow chiller there is uh, because it does do this really cool thing where it spins the water around the internal pipe and kind of slows it down a little bit. So you're actually getting a little bit higher chilling efficiency as a result of that, potentially using a little less water. So now that you know about all the options that you have, let's talk about what chiller I think makes sense for you based on what criteria of brewing is the most important to you. So if you're focused on saving money and the budget is the most important thing to you, then either using one of those DIY chiller methods that I mentioned earlier, the no chill method might be an option for you as well, or I would recommend sticking with an immersion chiller. They're generally the cheapest of the three dedicated work chillers. If your time is the most important thing to you when it comes to selecting a chiller, then what I would recommend is sticking with one of those chiller options that you can go through in a single pass, like the plate chiller or the counterflow chiller. These things make chilling a breeze for me. I'm able to transfer from the kettle into the fermenter in about 15 minutes and have a chilled wort like that. If water usage is the most important thing to you and you live either in a place where your water usage is regulated or you're just environmentally conscious and you don't want to use all that much for chilling, then using a plate chiller for its very high chilling efficiency or using a no chill method, I think really would be the best way to go. And lastly, if you brew beers with lots of hops in them very frequently, I actually would recommend a counterflow chiller because you're very unlikely to clog them um, and because you're getting that fast chill and so you're not over bittering your beer in the process. Nothing sucks more than brewing a hazy IPA, getting a clogged chiller and having that hazy IPA become way too bitter because the hops sat in the whirlpool for too long and it sucked to transfer the beer out of the kettle. I have been there and done that. so. Just uh, something to keep in mind. I personally use that counterflow chiller because I like to know that I'm not gonna clog my chiller, because I like to chill in one pass, and because I have relatively cold groundwater, so usage of the groundwater isn't a big concern to me. That's the reason why I use what I use, but your circumstance may be very different. Hopefully this video helped you understand what was gonna work best for your particular situation, and if it did, please hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. Please comment down below as well with your thoughts on the whole process. What type of chilling system do you use? If you wanna support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like this one. You can find this design and plenty of others in the merchandise store in the description box. I also have a Patreon, and my Patreon Patreon supporters have been incredibly helpful in making this channel a better place, especially production-wise. So they've been helping me get stuff like this new lighting setup that I've been using for the last several videos. I'm very happy with that. If you want to support me in other ways though, there's also the super thanks button and there's channel memberships. So feel free to check either of those options out as well. I also have an Amazon store, which is in the description box where you can find all the channel production stuff that's on Amazon, as well as my brewing equipment that I can find on Amazon and that I use on the regular. If you want to follow me in more than just YouTube, I'm also active on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer. So check those links out for some more frequent content and you can see what's going to come to the channel in the relatively near future. If you're still with us and you're still watching, thank you very much for watching all the way to the end of the video. These uh, videos take a long time to produce and it really means a lot uh, when people are watching the whole thing, especially when I have a kid now and it takes up a little bit more of my time. So anyway, thank you guys for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. So until then, cheers. Thank you.